You might have heard of Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, right? Hi, I'm Ben. I'm Jerry. The two childhood friends from Merrick, New York, grew up to become the hippie duo who gave us the world's favorite ice cream, Ben and Jerry's. Well, did you also know their path to success was full of hard work and just a little bit of luck? Grab a spoon, a pint of your favorite flavor, and get ready for today's video, which features Ben and Jerry's ice cream, founded by two childhood friends who are never really good at anything. From college dropouts to the kings of ice cream, we've got the ice cold facts about the history of Ben and Jerry and how they grew into an empire. By the way, if you like today's video, make sure you click on the subscribe button to catch even more of our stories. I wouldn't want you to miss anything. Ben and Jerry met back in 1963 when they were kids in a 7th grade gym class. Ben was never the most athletic kid, and when the students were forced to run a quarter mile every day, Ben always found himself at the back of the pack. The good news? Ben wasn't the only student that hated the class known as physical education. You see, Jerry hated gym as well, and he wasn't so talented in the running department. They began to strike up a friendship as they took their time completing laps and getting to know each other. Ben and I were not really in the mainstream of social activities in school. We were not cool kids. We were the nerdy kids. The boys casually kept in touch through high school until they found each other again as they were becoming young adults and trying their hand at college. You see, Jerry had become obsessed with getting into medical school after completing his pre-med, but kept failing to be admitted. Each time Jerry applied, he had to wait for another cycle to begin before he could try again. The process of failing was starting to wear thin on him. Ben dropped out of a few college courses, the last one being with the University Without Walls, one of the most laid-back universities in the U.S. Uh, I think we were the only two of our friends that uh, did not appear to be uh, getting anywhere in the world, so to speak. With nothing going on in both their lives, Jerry moved in and they both kept trying to figure out how they were going to keep making money without a real plan. The guys then decided to take jobs scooping ice cream at the cafe in Oberlin College to make some money. Once again, just like back in gym class, Ben and Jerry found themselves with a lot of time to talk. They had to figure out some way to live the rest of their lives. They couldn't scoop ice cream all day, could they? The hours turned into days, days to weeks, and about a thousand different ideas. Ben and Jerry realized that scooping ice cream was exactly what they needed to do. Oh, and did I also mention that these two had absolutely no business experience between the two of them? Let's have a think about this. Ben and Jerry decided to open an ice cream parlor after working in one for a summer, and they didn't know a thing about ice cream. Talk about risk. These two were basically making it all up as they went along. A dangerous way to run a business, right? Want to hear something else that was dangerous? Ben and Jerry launched their business on a hunch that all teenagers survived on a steady diet of ice cream. These guys were launching their business on a hunch. But you have to admit, they were determined. After endless hours of researching almanacs and comparing them to guides of college cities, they realized that every warm city they found already had an ice cream store. Seeing as they wanted to be the only store in the town they called home, they began to think outside the box. This is what led them to pick Burlington, Vermont, an hour and a half away from the Canadian border, as a location of their first store. Yeah, no ice cream stores in sight for miles. Their next move was to find a suitable site in town to set up shop. Most people would locate a lease on the city's main street, right in the heart of the hustle and bustle. But again, Ben and Jerry aren't most people. They decided to claim the old gas station that had fallen into disrepair. The reason was is that it had parking spaces in front where the gas pumps used to be. It would be an unbelievable bonus to have a spot where customers could park their cars and enjoy the cones. But what about capital? How are they going to pay for this new ice cream cone store? The boys began by asking money from friends and family to build a stake to start their new business. After raising $8,000 between the two of them, they needed at least $4,000 more to buy and renovate the gas station. Bank after bank, they faced the same problem. You see, the gas station could only be leased for a year at a time. There weren't many banks that wanted to fund a business without a permanent home. We were going to go into the local bank to try to borrow some money. And as we thought about it, we realized the local bank might not be that excited about lending us money. Finally, after many months of failed meetings and feet and doors, Ben and Jerry were able to secure the $4,000 loan they needed to commence construction. Hence, Ben and Jerry's was born. But what about the ice cream? How did that end up being what some considered the best tasting ice cream in the world? Well, that's where a little luck came in and the power of turning a negative into a positive. You see, Ben suffers from a condition called severe anosmia, 
a lack of sense of smell. And so he had to really rely on mouthfeel and texture to provide variety in his diet. This is what led to the company's trademark chunks being mixed in with their ice cream. Cherry Garcia wouldn't be the same without it. On May 5th, 1978, the first Ben & Jerry store opened for business. Summer was a moderate success, but by late September, the cold winds from the north had begun to blow in. And as winter gripped Burlington, sales froze. It's uh, damn cold here in uh, Burlington, Vermont. And uh, sure enough, come the winter, nobody was buying our ice cream. I mean, no one really wants to eat ice cream when it's freezing outside. Desperate for help and falling behind in low payments, the duo went to the services provided by the Small Business Association and applied to take part in a mentor program that was being offered at the time. They met with an older man named Manny. They told him about the struggles they were facing to come up with their loan payments, and they were worried they were going to lose their business. That's when Manny let the pair in on a bit of a secret called a moratorium. A moratorium meant that the team could put a pause on their loan payments for a certain amount of time and only have to pay interest. Today, banks call them payment vacations. He advised Ben and Jerry to call the bank and tell them that they couldn't pay and needed a moratorium. That way, the guys only had to pay interest for the time being. Much to their surprise, the bank agreed to cut the guys a break. And what if the bank had said no? Well, we wouldn't be able to enjoy a pint of Chunky Monkey because Ben and Jerry would have never existed. Is life worth living? Now, with things looking up, the boys were giving out massive scoops and cultivating a great in-store shopping experience. Only problem was, they were pretty bad at almost everything else that comes with running your own business. Working 16 hours a day, 7 days a week, they weren't able to achieve the standards that they had set out for themselves from the beginning. In 1980, even those giant scoops of ice cream were taking their toll, as they were driving up supply costs for the store. And on top of that, equipment was super faulty. With little to no cash when they were beginning, the equipment that the guys had was bottom of the barrel and went offline regularly. This meant that small amounts of ice cream would melt. The two would store the melted ice cream in pint-sized containers so they could sell it to the different stores and restaurants they had begun to serve through distribution. We would fill up the styrofoam box with tubs of ice cream and then Ben would drive around Vermont as fast as he could trying to sell this ice cream to restaurants around Vermont before it melted. It turns out that Jerry had a passion for driving and had decided to deliver the pint-sized containers of ice cream to various locations himself after building connections with the store owners. The business was beginning to take off, but they had a bigger problem lurking right around the corner. At around the same time, the Pillsbury Company had just bought the ice cream brand Haagen-Dazs. The Pillsbury Company was already a massive food manufacturer in North America, famous for its baked goods, croissants, and super cute mascot, the Pillsbury Doughboy. Pillsbury had begun to analyze the numbers on their new acquisition, Haagen-Dazs, and they began to notice that sales of their ice cream had started to drop off the map in a convenience store in Boston. Pillsbury sent analysts down to the store to find out why this was happening. They weren't too happy to find out the reason they were losing revenue was to this new hippie ice cream, Ben & Jerry. They had purchased haagen to own the ice cream industry, not to watch this country bumpkin ice cream eat into their profits. They started threatening stores and asking them to sign contracts stating they wouldn't sell Ben & Jerry's ice cream going forward. If a store or restaurant disobeyed, they were likely to have all of their Pillsbury products removed, like their famous crescent rolls and highly demanded chocolate chip cookie dough. Most stores couldn't handle the financial stress of losing all of Pillsbury's popular products, and it looked like they were going to be forced to cut ties with Ben & Jerry. This was the real threat, and it looked like Pillsbury was controlling the marketplace, driving them out of business. Ben & Jerry felt they possibly had a case against the corporate giant. In reality, Pillsbury had way too much money and way too many lawyers to even explore the possibility. But, you know, the lawyer said, uh, well, you know, Pillsbury, you know, they're a four billion dollar company. This is where Ben and Jerry decided to pick a fight with a bit of a doughboy. There was no doubt that the Pillsbury doughboy was the cutest food mascot of the time. Going after him would be tough. The plan started with Jerry heading to the Pillsbury headquarters, located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Day after day, he'd be seen standing in front of the building, holding a handwritten sign that asked the question, What's the Doughboy afraid of? Uh, as part of this campaign, uh, Jerry became a one-man corporate picket outside the Pillsbury World Headquarters in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, carrying this uh, sign, What's the Doughboy Afraid of? They then took out a little classified ad in the back of the Rolling Stone magazine. 
flew giant aerial banners all over multiple Boston sports venues, and plastered bus stops around the city as well. All of these mediums shouted the same question, what's the Doughboy afraid of? And had a picture of the Doughboy's chubby little hands trying to strangle a pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Could you imagine? No small company had done anything like this before, and the duo had positioned themselves as David in this battle against the corporate Goliath. After time, and another failed attempt at forcing exclusive distribution, Pillsbury finally relented in its attempts to squeeze Ben & Jerry out of the market. The reason? The media coverage that had been produced from the What's the Doughboy Afraid of campaign. You see, the resulting coverage had turned Ben & Jerry into a household name, and customers from all over the country were clamoring to find a pint of the delicious frozen treat. This brilliant marketing plan, delicious and cleverly named ice cream, and the ability to take misfortune and turn it into a positive, took Ben & Jerry from a simple ice cream parlor worth $4 million to an ice cream powerhouse with a net worth of $300 million and over 600 locations worldwide. Yet, with the rapid growth came other problems. The two hippies who had found so much success with their unique take on ice cream were unhappy with the company's direction and the way they were living their lives. You see, the guys indeed were original hippies, and the stakeholder meetings, hiring and firing, and the daily grind had started to take its toll. The boys really began to question why they were still part of the corporate world anyway, as they never really loved it in the first place. The duo had begun to think about selling the company, as they had stopped taking part in the parts of the business that they loved, like talking with customers and scooping ice cream. At this point, Ben had a chance encounter with an old friend, and let him know about his thoughts on selling the business. Ben's friend was in shock, as the business still had so much potential to grow. Ben was quoted as saying, You know what business does? It exploits the community, it exploits its employees, and it exploits the environment. That's when his friend asked him the question that made Ben really think. If there's something that you don't like about your business, why don't you do it differently? What a concept. Ben and Jerry then decided to conduct a little experiment with their ice cream company. Could business be used as a method for improving the quality of someone's life instead of making it worse? The pair instituted a new policy where the highest paid employee couldn't earn more than five times the salary of an entry level worker. They also supplied college tuition aid, built a daycare for employees, and introduced profit sharing. Ben and Jerry are a fantastic example of how you can make a profit and address social issues that need a platform. In 2000, the business world finally took its toll on the soul of these two hippies from Merrick, and Ben and Jerry finally decided to sell the company for good, when Unilever bought the entire business at a commanding $326 million. Interestingly enough, the duo didn't want to sell the Unilever, the world's third largest consumer goods company, as they were very concerned that Unilever would drop their social missions, favoring the bottom line instead. And so, in the contract of sale, they actually stipulated that the deal could only be agreed upon if Unilever created an independent group to oversee the social issues, brand integrity, and the policies of Ben & Jerry's. Class acts right to the end of their run at the helm, Ben & Jerry ensured that their affinity for social causes would continue in their absence from the company they had created. From the back of the pack to the social change leaders, Ben & Jerry did their homework, searched out help when they needed it, and thought outside of the box to bring a massive food distributor down to their knees and lift their small little ice cream store to new heights and into freezers everywhere. What a story! Reminds me a lot of the story behind Louis Vuitton. From a homeless boy to founding a multi-billion dollar luxury brand. If you haven't yet watched our video about that story, I'll leave a link on screen for you to check it out now. And don't forget, if you enjoyed this video, hit the subscribe button to stay up to date for more videos just like this.